So I'm gonna make sure y'all get this. It was 45 minutes. I had to ride three buses to get to downtown Chicago to go to a closing shift where I stood at the door saying, hi, my name is Howard, welcome to The Gap. For Lester to tell me I had 15 minutes on break, and when I came back, I had to clean the toilets, only to make no kind of money because of FICA, and Oni didn't even work when I was there. I quit. Because what they were asking of me was more than what they were paying me. And beloved, there comes a moment in every assignment when you've got a way out, is this really worth it? If you value who you are, if you value the skills you bring, if you value the presence and, and the power that you add to something, there comes a moment when you've got to ask yourself, does this match? Is this worth it? And the natural instinct when it's not worth it is to quit. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. We'll get the mics ready, we'll get them fixed. Put your hands together while you can. Right there. Hallelujah, ah, there we go. Anybody come to let the glory of the Lord rise? Did you bring a praise in your spirit today? Did you bring a praise in your spirit today? Here we go, say. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Yeah. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the
what you say. He loves you too much. Come on, say it. I won't give up on God. Cause he won't give up. you to shout out the two words that you sang. One, two, three. He is about them. Hey, I know too much about them. We have a history. And he said, I will do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that I could ask or think. God is able to do all of those things. He's able. Amen and amen and amen. Good morning, Alpha Street. For well, it is a great morning. It is a wonderful morning because this is the day that the Lord has made and we are rejoicing in it, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Our scripture reading will be from Psalm 103, verses one through five. Oh yes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. We have come to the moment in service where we are going to lift up persons in our midst who are grieving at this time and other concerns. We want to lift up Zenithia Clemens Carter in the, dis in the passing of her nephew, Hugh Thomas Douglas. Sister Ray Martell in the passing of Cameron Wells, her brother-in-law. Gregory Lord Just in the passing of Joseph Lord Just, his father. Ricky Griswold in the passing of Gary L. Griswold, his brother. Sister Ethel Hughes in the passing of James Hughes, her husband. And we want to lift up Daryl and Tiffany Gilligard in the passing of their mother, Annie Chester. If there are anyone else that you would like to lift up, let's do that at this time. Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Lord, we are grateful that you have been here and you were with us as we slumbered because you never slumber nor sleep. We are grateful, God, that you love us this much, that you gave us another day as another chance. And as we lift up the names that we have given in this body, we pray, God, for those also who were not named, those who are in our midst, those concerns that are troubling us at night. We pray, God, that you would touch those things, that you would begin to heal the brokenhearted right now in the name of Jesus, that you will protect those that need protection, that you will heal those that need healing, Lord God, and give peace where there is none. We pray, God, over this sanctuary and those within and those who are watching by the World Wide Web, we pray, God, that this service will be pleasing unto you. 
that everyone will be on one accord, and that is to lift your name high. Because you said, if I be lifted up, you will draw everyone to you. So we are here, Lord, at your feet, casting all of our cares to you because you care for us. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Join us in our hymn of rejoicing. We'll understand it by and by. that peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen.
Good morning, Alfred Street. To our guests who grace us with the presence of God by your presence in this sacred space that we call sanctuary, and to our worshiping family who's connected with us all across the world wide web. Grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as mother and father, and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning redeemer. If you know that it is only of the Lord's mercies that you've not been consumed this week, would you help me thank God for bringing us through another week of the dangers seen and unseen? How we praise God that his mercies are brand new every morning, that they fail not. Amen. One of the reasons we celebrate communion every Sunday is to remind ourselves that it is only of the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, that in him our sins are forgiven, that in the death of Jesus Christ our new life begins, and that the blood washes us of all of our unrighteousness. We celebrate an open communion at Alpha Street with all those who accept and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose again, Prayerfully, when you came in today, you received the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you did not, just kindly wave a hand. We have deacons who are prepared to serve those who are in need. While they're doing that, we want to encourage those who are watching online to join in with us, taking hold of whatever you would use as bread and cup to symbolize the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is our Christ. One of the questions people continue to ask me is how life is going without the oldest son in the house and me just being left alone with Cooper. I'll tell you, it's a magnificent experience. Cooper is a whole different child. It's, it's amazing how when you have two kids, they can be as different as night and day. Um, Marcia Cooper has a bad habit, though, that gets on my nerves. He, when he watches on television, he watches the same shows over and over and over and over and over again. He's watched them so much, I know the lines. I know the jokes. He, he watches The Office repeatedly. He's seen it time and time and time and time again. And I asked him, why do you keep watching it? And this is what he said, Dad, it's so good, I just want to see it again. It's, it's so good, I just want more of it. It's so good that I just have to get into it one more time. That there's some things that are just so good that no matter how much or how well we think we know them, they always have new meaning to us. They always bring joy to us. We can never get enough of celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was so good that it still cleanses us to this day. So let's have a little rewind. Let's have a little repeat. Let's, let's have a little watch again of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. The bread that we eat represents the broken body of Jesus who is our Savior and our Christ. He was crucified and he died. He was buried and he rose again from the dead. He showed himself strong and ascended into heaven, where he's now sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for our sins. And one day, to the glory of God, we believe he is coming back. Let us break bread and eat together. In this cup is the memorial of the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins and the redemption of our souls. We drink of this cup reminding ourselves that it is only through the blood of Jesus that we are connected eternally with our God. This cup represents his blood shed on the cross of Calvary. Let us drink together. Won't you pray with me? What you offer to us in your grace, we receive through our faith. The complete and utter forgiveness of our sins, the eternal security of our soul's salvation, the precious promise of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is pleasing and guided by your will, and the assignment we have to infect others with the love of Jesus Christ, that we might make more disciples. You have forgiven us now, Lord, may we learn to forgive one another. And as you've loved us, may we seek to love each other. In the precious and the powerful name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. And as we hear their names, we would remember them in prayer, and that one day these names would resonate with greatness and excellence. 
and most of all, salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, we believe that somewhere in this midst is the next leader, somewhere is another preacher, somewhere may be the next president of the United States of America. God, order their steps. We pray against any demonic disturbance, any demonic perversion. We pray against any molestation, any sexual violence, any addiction. We pray, oh God, against any discouraging school teacher or counselor that will not encourage them to stand in the fullness of their gift. We speak, O oh Lord, that they will overcome any educational, any physical, any mental, any spiritual delays, oh God, that you would raise them up strong and that their lives would bear witness of your goodness and your grace. We thank you and we present them now before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Family, you know how we do it in just a moment. Moms, dads, parents are gonna bring their baby to the altar. We're gonna hear that name. We're gonna make sure we say it correctly because names matter. They will then be anointed with oil and then one of the parents is gonna lift that child up in the air and when that happens, I want y'all to shout like Jesus just came back um, as we welcome and celebrate the gift of life at the altar. And what is the name of your son? Dallas Markeith Davis. I'm going to ask all the family of Dallas Markeith Davis to please stand as we bless him today. I bless and anoint thee, Dallas Markeith Davis, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master Dallas family. Congratulations. Okay. And tell me how I pronounce it correctly. Micah Jelani Awara Dale. Micah Jelani and Awara Dale. Did I get it right? Yes. We're going to ask all those who are here celebrating the life of Micah Jelani and Awara Dale to please stand. Amen. I bless thee, Micah Jelani and Awara Dale. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master Micah family, would you? Congratulations. And what is the name of your daughter? Will all those who are here to celebrate the life of Aria Lauren English please stand? She's gorgeous. I bless the Aria Lauren English in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come on, y'all, let's wake up Aria. Amen. <laughs> Got two, huh? Okay. What's the name of your son and daughter? Malcolm. Malcolm Hugh McCleary. And your daughter? Maya Noel McCleary. Well, all those who are here to help celebrate and give thanks to God for Malcolm Hugh and Maya Noel McCleary, please stand. I bless the North Malcolm Hugh McCleary in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Master Malcolm, everyone. And I bless thee, Maya Noel McClary. Oh, don't you look at me like that. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Miss Maya Noel, would you help me celebrate the McClary's today? Congratulations. This way here, to your left. Thank you. And what is the name of your daughter? Anaya Simone McNabb. We're going to ask all those who are here with Anaya Simone McNabb to please stand. Oh. 
I bless thee, Anaya Simone McNabb, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Miss Anaya, everyone, would you celebrate God for her today? Congratulations. And what is the name of your son? Nasir Ahmad Sinclair. Well, all those who are here to celebrate Nasir Ahmad Sinclair, please stand. Well, he is knocked out. I bless thee, Nasir. <laughs> Nasir Ahmad Sinclair, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Master Nasir family. Congratulations. All right. We have two. What are the name of your son and your daughter? Maxwell Lloyd Hardy and Elodine Sky Hardy. Will all those who are here celebrating Maxwell Lloyd and Elodine Sky Hardy please stand? I bless the Elodine Sky Hardy in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Miss Elodine family. <laughs> and I bless the Maxwell Lloyd Hardy in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Master Maxwell family, would you help me celebrate them today? Congratulations. And what is this beautiful young lady's name? Charlie Evelyn Smith. Will all those who are here to celebrate Charlie Evelyn Smith please stand? I bless thee, Charlie Evelyn Smith, in the name of God the Father, God the Son. <laughs> And, and God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Miss Charlie, everyone. <laughs> Congratulations, you all. <laughs> it was the name of your daughter? Duna Lorraine Tafara Pierre. Duna Lorraine Tafara Pierre. Did I get that right? You did. Will all those who are here to celebrate Duna Lorraine to Fara Pierre please stand? I bless thee, Duna Lorraine to Fara Pierre in the name of. In the name of God the. Ooh, God the Father, God the Son. And God the. The Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> God, would you help welcome Dula Lorraine to Far Pierre? Yeah. Right. And what is the name of your son? Aaron John Ash Jackson. We're going to ask all those who are here to help celebrate the life of Aaron John Ash Jackson to please stand. I bless thee, Aaron John Ash Jackson, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Master Aaron John family. Would you... Congratulations. Family, would you help me thank God for the gift of new life that we celebrate on today? As we gather this morning and we celebrate new life in Christ Jesus, we want to give thanks to God that on yesterday we baptized 42 new believers into the body of Christ Jesus. Amen. We thank God for all those who've opened up their heart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to all those who were able to celebrate with us yesterday as we took them to the waters of baptism. 
There are other things that we celebrate today. We celebrate the presence of God through our guest. If you are a guest of our church family, we want to let you know we take that seriously. The Bible says that whenever you have a stranger in your midst, there's an angel on your pew. We want to recognize the angels of Alpha Tree today. If you're a guest and you don't mind being recognized, would you just wave a hand in the air that we might recognize the angels today? Alpha Tree, help me thank God for our guests. Welcome, 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 welcome. We're grateful that God has allowed you to be in worship with us today. We pray that God will give you traveling grace and mercy as you return to wherever home may be. And please know that if you're ever in the local DMV area, we would love to have you in worship. Join us online. Become of our church family. If you don't have a church home already, we welcome you to Alfred Street. Today we also celebrate the grace of God in life that continues to give uh, us another year of the blessings of the Lord. If you're here today and you're celebrating a recent birthday, if your birthday has just come and gone and you want to thank God that he gave you another trip around the sun. We're going to ask all of our birthdays to please stand that we may recognize them today. All of our birthdays, congratulations. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to each and every one of you. We pray that you enjoy the gift of life that God has given you. We also want to recognize anniversaries. We thank God for the gift of love in our church family. We celebrate anniversaries. We call out how many years you've been married. The reason we do that, there's some single folk that need to be encouraged in the house of God to know that, that Sharice was right when she said, God is able. Um, if you're celebrating a recent anniversary, would you stand and remain standing that we may give thanks to God for all of our couples as they stand. Alpha Street, help me thank God for our anniversaries today. Amen. Please remain standing. But brothers and sisters, how many years are you all celebrating? 36, congratulations. <laughs> Brother Williams, how you doing, sir? Ladies and gentlemen, the president of Hampton University is in the house. We want to welcome General Darrell Williams. Welcome to Alpha Street today. Bless you. Okay, okay. How many years are you all celebrating? Year one. Year one. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Looks like we made it. Praise be unto God. Congratulations for your first anniversary. All the way up in the back, how many years are you celebrating? 32. Congratulations on 32 years. Amen. Okay. How many years you got? 18. My husband is home not well, so I'm standing. You standing for your husband? He's at home. He's watching 18. Congratulations on your 18th anniversary. How many years you are celebrating? 40, Monty, congratulations on 40. Congrats. Let's go, how many you got? 18. 18, congratulations on 18th anniversary. Amen. D, how many are we celebrating? Nine, congratulations on your ninth anniversary. Alpha Street, help me thank God for all those who are celebrating the gift of love. It's just a good season to be grateful to God. We're thanking the Lord in this season of celebrating 15 years of pastoring people. I want to invite you out this Wednesday. This Wednesday at 7 o'clock, if you'll join me here. Some of you all weren't able to make Israel Houghton's concert. That's all right. The pastor's going to be in concert here on, on this Wednesday um, at 7 p.m. Amen, amen. It, it's my anniversary. I can sing if I want to. Um, so uh, I want to enjoy you to fellowship with us on Wednesday for a time of prayer and praising as we lift up some of those great hymns of the church that have anchored all of us through our seasons of life and we give to God also in our time of prayer. So join us if you will on this Wednesday. Then on next Sunday, someone say next Sunday. Please don't show up here at 8 o'clock because we will not be here. Amen. We're going to be at Strathmore at 11 o'clock for one service to celebrate the 15 years we're welcoming the Reverend Dr. Marcus D. Cosby and the 325 member voice choir of Wheeler Avenue. Bap amen. They are bringing 300 folk to, amen, to sing. L listen, don't let there be more Wheeler out there than Alpha Street. I'm just letting you know <laughs> it's going to be a problem and a situation. So do me a favor. Uh, join us next Sunday at 11 o'clock at Strathmore. If you're not able to be present, you can watch online as we thank God for what the Lord has joined together in these 15 years of pastoring people. 
Then finally, you all know from the video that was played earlier that we're still receiving nominations for our leadership offices. I'm asking you to be in prayer, to go beyond simply watching worship and simply being in the sanctuary, but helping us shape and discern the voice and the vision of God for this church family. If you would be prayerful about using your gifts and your skills and the calling of God on your life to help us build this church family, we would be grateful. As we get ready to be blessed in song, I'm also going to ask if you will to be generous in your giving. You know that we don't raise an official offering at Alfred Street. It's not because we don't need it. It's just that we believe that you're mature enough to do the right thing without anybody forcing you to do so. Maturity always recognizes that God's been good to us. Maturity recognizes that in response, I want to be good to God. And I want to render unto the Lord that which the Lord has required of me. We don't beg, we don't plead, we don't make promises. This is what we ask you to do. Be prayerful. Ask the Lord what you are required to give, and then you know all the platforms online in which you can render your gift. If you're watching online today, we invite and encourage you to join us in making glorious the name of Jesus Christ through our giving. We're blessed in song now with the word of God from the voice of triumph, and then we'll receive the word of God in sermon, and then we'll go out and live the word of God in our daily living. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, praise. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. This song says, through the eyes of faith. Anybody choosing to see through the eyes of faith? Hallelujah. Through the eyes of faith. Through the eyes of faith. I see God's grace through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of faith, I see God's grace through the eyes of faith, I see God's grace through the eyes See? 
for weeping may endure for a night, but joy, 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 joy cometh in the morning. Hey, I choose to sing with God. See, God is working it out. Yes, He is working it out. Yes, He is. up a praise right here no matter what it feels like no matter what it looks like in the natural we know that God is working it out God says yes you can pray but I need you to look again he's working it out God says you can sing all night long but I need you to look again he's working it out he's working it out he says look again look again Look again, look again, look again, look again, look again, look again. Hallelujah! Pray with me, family. God, we thank you for the power of your word. That you stepped in the middle of nothing and spoke and what wasn't had to be by the power of your word. I believe even now, oh God, you're able to speak over what looks like nothing in our lives and create everything thou hast ordained. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. During the season of celebrating these 15 years, God has blessed us with this pastor and people. I found myself in a place of reflection. There and taking a moment to reflect on the scriptures in God's word that have held me together and ones that I know I've held on to during these seasons of life. And I want to thank you for affording me the privilege over these few Sundays to share with you in a series called Pastor's Picks, where you take some time to sermonically study some of those scriptures that anchor us through the storms of life. For those that are not with us, last weekend we began this journey with those powerful and prophetic words of the prophet Isaiah, who simply said in chapter 40, they that wait on the Lord and shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. If it's all right with you today, briefly and quickly, I'd like to take you into another passage that I found has been critical to my own walk with the Lord and my own ministry and attempt to be a faithful pastor. I'm going to invite you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul as he writes in the book of Galatians. In the New Testament, Galatians chapter 6. We invite those who are physically able to stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's holy word. From Galatians chapter 6, it'll be on the screen as well as in your Bible and on your devices. Galatians chapter 6 begins with a very oft-quoted passage in verse 7. It really reads a little something like this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever you sow, you're also going to reap. For whoever sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And whoever sows to the spirit of the spirit will reap eternal life. Here's what I hold on to. Let us not grow weary in doing well, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season 
we will reap if we faint not. Don't give up on doing good. Because at the right time, you will reap if you don't quit. Do me a favor, encourage your neighbor with today's sermon title. Tell them, neighbor, neighbor. Old, neighbor. old neighbor, I just, I just can't, quit. can't quit. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I just can't quit. There's something I want to share with you from my personal life that I've held for these 15 years that we've been together. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. I want you to know that in my 51 years of life, I've only been able to hold down three jobs. <laughs> and two of them have been pastoring. I'm really glad that you all have kept me for these 15 years because I fear I'd have trouble getting a job with what little I could put on my resume. Besides pastoring for 10 years in Massachusetts and now 15 years here at Alfred Street, there's only one other job I've had. Back in 1988, I worked at Water Tower Place in Chicago at a store called The Gap. <laughs> and I worked at The Gap for all of 14 days before I quit. <laughs> Let me explain. Back in 1988, I was a sophomore in high school, and I had a crush on a senior in my high school named Oni. Oni was not only captain of the girls' basketball team, but she had just been promoted to assistant manager at The Gap. <laughs> the word around high school was that Oni could hook you up with a job at The Gap. So I went down to Water Tower and I applied and got the job and was excited because I figured not only will I make some money, but now I get to see Oni. That's not quite how it went down. Um, first of all, you need to know I wasn't driving at the time. I didn't have a car. And the gap was 45 minutes from where I lived, and I had to take Chicago Transit Authority. That's the public bus. And it would take me 45 minutes to get to Water Tower to work at the gap. Sharice, I mistakenly thought that I could choose my hours and days upon which I would work, and I wanted to work on Friday evenings and Saturday mornings at the height of people coming by the Gap. No, when you're new at the Gap, you get assigned the time you're going to work, and I was assigned closing. If you've never worked retail, allow me to tell you <laughs> how unenjoyable working closing is. You come in about two to three hours before the store closes and you stay four hours later refolding everything to get the store ready for the next day. There's not even a customer in the store while you're folding up clothes. I was assigned closing. Uh, not only do you get assigned your shift, but you get assigned the station you're going to work at at the Gap. Hear me, you all. You don't just get to work where you want. They tell you where you're going to work. My first assignment was folding up women's jeans, and I hated refolding jeans. I was at that station until one day I saw a lady come in after I had folded up jeans. She was looking for her size, and she kept unfolding. And I kindly said to her, ma'am, unless you plan on refolding all those jeans, why don't you ask for some help? Well, Mel, after I got written up and sent to a... I got sent to the station I didn't like, which is called the greeter. The greeter is a person that stands at the door of the gap for their entire shift, and they stand there, and they welcome everyone that walks in with these words. Hi, I'm Howard. Welcome to the gap. Hi, I'm Howard. Welcome to the gap. Hi, I'm Howard. Welcome to the gap. That was all I did. It gets worse, because I didn't know at the time that Oni didn't work the closing shift. Lester did. 
Lester was the assistant manager, and I did not like Lester. <laughs> Lester was mean. Lester didn't know what he was doing. And Lester made it clear that I only had one 15-minute break, and if I was late, I was going to be fired. I recognized then I am not made to work for someone who's going to tell me that I can only take a 15-minute break. Whenever I would come back, Lester would tell me in closing that now my station was the dressing room. I had to refold all the clothes, and I had to clean the bathroom after the gap had closed. This clearly was not God's will for my life. <laughs> Um, it gets a little bit worse. I thought that when you worked at the Gap, uh, when you worked on the week, you would get paid that week. <laughs> That's not the way it works. Uh, it takes about two weeks for your hours to get registered so the paycheck does not come immediately. And when I got my first paycheck, CJ, to say I was disappointed would be an understatement. I had never heard of FICA. I didn't know who FICA was. I didn't know what FICA did. Well, let me tell you that when you only earn $7 an hour and you only work 15 hours in a pay period, by the time FICA hits your check, you ain't making a whole lot of money. I want to make certain you catch this. I had to take three CTA buses to travel 45 minutes to get to the water tower to work closing shift where I stood and said, hi, I'm Howard, welcome to the Gap, for Lester who told me I could only take a 15 minute break to come back and clean the toilets after the store had closed to make a little bit of money and there was no Oni. Y'all, I tell you, I quit. <laughs> because what they were asking of me was more than what they were paying me. And there comes a moment when you've got to examine how much you're giving for how much you're getting and ask yourself, is this worth it? If you really value yourself and your skills, if you value who you are, if you value what God has graced you to do, there come moments in life where you have to say to yourself, this ain't worth it. I wish I could tell you that I only felt that way working at The Gap, if I could be honest with you, there have been many and multiple moments when I have felt that way pastor in this church. I know you didn't come to church to hear that. But there have been many moments when I've wondered, is this worth it? You preach your hardest and try your best, and there are always folk with criticisms and something to say. Is this worth it? When rumors circulate about personal matters that ain't none of your business. Is this worth it? Preaching four services over the weekend and reaching a place where I could barely walk and could not speak on Monday morning. Is this worth it? Every time I walk out of a four-hour board meeting where nothing has happened other than fighting, is this worth it? Sitting down in meetings where the same issue is debated over and over and over and over again, and people are not willing to follow the leadership of their pastor, is this worth it? Taking the high road with people who like the gutter. Is this worth it? Having to cater to fragile egos and navigate around people's insecurities. God, is this worth it? Trying to do right with folk that always want to look for, cause, and create problems. God, is this worth it? Beloved, don't look at me like that. You've been there on your job. You've been there in your marriage. You've been there in any organization you volunteer with. And believe it or not, you can even get there with God. Come, come here. There, there is a silent sin that no one tells you about when you join church. And that is that sometimes it feels like walking with God is futile. 
It feels like there's no reward. It feels like what God asks of you is not commensurate with what God gives you. That what faith demands doesn't match up with what faith delivers. That the requirements of righteousness are not always rewarded. And that the attempt to be holy for the Lord doesn't grant you the immunity from some struggles it ought to give you. Have you ever been in a place where it felt like you were doing your part, but God was slow to do his? Is it worth it? If you keep living, life will put you in that place where you question whether this thing called faith and Christianity and discipleship is worth it. Why do I keep praying when there ain't no answer? Why keep coming to church on Sunday and nothing's changing on Monday? Why keep reading my Bible if it's not affecting my life? Why am I trying to be nice to folk who don't know how to be nice in return? Why did I give up cussing? with some folk that deserve to be cussed out. Uh, This, this ain't worth it. When you walk with God, there will become moments in that journey when it seems like righteousness has no reward. The doing good is repaid with evil. The trying to live right doesn't keep you out of the storms. Or is this worth it? Now, before you judge me or your neighbor for being there, let me tell you that that's exactly where the Apostle Paul is in 55 AD when he writes this letter from Ephesus to the church in Galatia. When Paul writes this letter... I want you to read it when you get home. You'll find that this is not the Paul you expect to encounter. It's only six chapters. You can read it in your devotional time this evening. You will find that this is not the Paul you're used to. This is not the Paul who says, all things work together for the good of them. That No, this is the Paul who in chapter 2 tells Peter and Barnabas, Y'all are liars and hypocrites in the presence of other folk. Marcia, this is not the Paul who would tell us, be kindly affectionate to one another and forgive one another in righteousness. No, this is the Paul who in chapter 5, verse 12 says this, any of y'all who disagree with me need to castrate yourself. This is not the Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 15, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. No, this is the Paul who comes to the end of this book and has to encourage himself and tell himself, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Paul, you can't give up because in due season, we will reap if we faint not. Paul has reached the place where he's ready to give up on the assignment God has given him. Now, since we come to Alf Street to learn something, what you ought to be asking is, why is Paul so angry? Why is he so frustrated? Why does Paul have to tell himself not to quit? Well, remember, context is important. You can't really understand Paul's letters without understanding the exigence, the context in which they're written. So when you go back and you read these six chapters, you're going to find out here's why Paul is ready to give up. And listen for how it resonates with your life. Paul's ready to give up because when you read in Galatians, what happens in Galatians goes all the way back to a sermon series your pastor just preached called a good argument. You remember the good argument in Acts chapter 15, 
Paul and Barnabas have to go from Antioch to Jerusalem to settle a matter they're having with a group called the Judaizers. The Judaizers, President Williams, are Jewish Christians who believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but said the only way to be a Christian was to first be a Jew. That you had to enter the Mosaic Covenant and the promise of God to Abraham, which requires circumcision. And so the Judaizers kept pressing that if you are a Christian man, you must be circumcised. And in Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas have gone with the Judaizers from Antioch to Jerusalem to settle the matter, and the matter was settled by James, who said you don't have to be circumcised. And when we get to Galatians, guess who's back? The Judaizers. They've come back again. The same folk he'd been messing with five years ago in Antioch are now back in Galatia preaching the same old thing. You got to be circumcised. They won't let it go. They follow Paul, arguing with Paul, creating problems with Paul, raising the same issue with Paul. And notice, you know what will make you want to quit? When you realize with some folk, you just can't win. You know what will make you want to give up? When you're dealing with folk that find reasons to create problems. You know what will make you want to quit church? Folk who just won't let it go. So no matter what you do, they hold on to the issue. You can't love them enough. You can't be nice enough. You can't say, I'm sorry enough. You can't try to move on enough. Every time you see them, they got the same old issue. And when you feel like you can't win with some people, can I push it? Not only have the Judaizers shown up, but Paul gets upset. You keep reading. When you get to chapter 3, Paul is upset with the church in Galatia because this is what he says. He said, listen, I came and I preached Jesus to you. I didn't preach the law. You all got saved and experienced the Holy Spirit on Jesus alone. And now here come these Judaizers telling you something different, and y'all fell for it. You heard what I preached, you got saved, you experienced the Holy Ghost, and now y'all turned on me after everything I've done for you. You know what to make you want to quit? When folk you've done a lot for aren't loyal in return. When you've committed yourself and given of yourself, and volunteered yourself, and sacrificed yourself, and sacrificed your time, and put away things you could have been doing, and enjoying more, and the people you were serving, the people you were ministering to, the people you were giving yourself to, turn on you at the drop of a dime. People who should have had your back. The fairness between you and me, when, when you serve and there's no recognition and no appreciation and no respect, can I push it? He's got the Judaizers. He's got the Galatians who've turned their back on him. And remember, I told y'all he wrote this letter in A.D. 55. That doesn't mean much to you. Until you remember that AD 55, Judy, that's the exact same time he got a letter from Chloe about all hell breaking loose in Corinth. Corinth is another church Paul established. So while he's trying to fix Corinth, now he got to deal with Galatia. Oh, I got one thing. And as soon as I got that right, something else jumped off. You, you know what to make you want to quit? When if it ain't one thing... Y'all let me preach. Uh, when it's one problem after another problem after another problem after another problem and you reach the place where you feel that everything you're doing ain't making a difference because if it ain't one thing, it's another. 
He's got the Judaizers. He's got a crowd that doesn't appreciate him. He's got multiple problems. And y'all, here's the third reason, I mean the fourth reason Paul wants to quit. I love this one because he says in chapter 2, watch this, that Peter and Barnabas flipped on me. Peter was the leader of the church who in Acts 15 agreed circumcision wasn't necessary. And now here he is showing up in Galatia telling folk, Circum Peter, you flipped. Barnabas was my dog. Barnabas was my partner. Barnabas rolled with me, and Barnabas flipped with me in front of these folks. I, I thought the leadership would be strong. I thought y'all would stand by the decision you made. I, I thought that if you changed your mind, you would at least integrate me into the conversation, and nothing will make you quit more than weak leadership. Leaders who say one thing in your face and another thing at the committee meeting. Leaders who say they got your back until they find out the crowd wants to move in a different direction. Leadership that makes changes without valuing your voice and your input and you will quit with poor leadership. Here's why Paul wants to quit. I got the group I can't win with. I got folk that don't appreciate what I'm doing. If it ain't one thing, it's another. And these leaders keep flipping on me. No wonder Paul has to tell himself, don't quit. Don't grow weary, Paul, in doing well, because if anything will make you grow weary, it's people who don't appreciate you. It's work that doesn't get any recognition. It's sacrifice that has no reward. It's doing good to folk who want to do bad. It's trying to stay high with folk that want to go low. It's trying to do right with folk that like going left. It will make you want to quit. Have you ever grown weary in well-doing? The amazing thing, Marcy, is that Paul recognizes it's possible to grow weary doing well. That, that, that it's amazing how quickly we can get frustrated with doing right when there's no reward. Now, here's the amazing thing, and I want to see how many folk are woke on this. You can grow weary doing well, but it's amazing how you never grow tired being ugly. <laughs> Have you ever noticed you never get sick and tired of being nasty? Revenge always feels good. Cussing folk out. Immediate gratification. <laughs> Being ugly has no expiration date. I can prove it, because there's some folk you know now been ugly their whole life, and they've never gotten tired of being nasty. They've never given up being mean. They find new ways to go low. Uh, you never get tired being ugly but we get frustrated doing right. So Paul has to say to himself what he instructs us with, don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you don't quit. Try it again, don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap if you don't quit. I don't know who this is for. It ain't a shout. It's just a mode of meditation. Don't you quit on doing right. Don't you give up on serving the Lord. 
Don't you let go of God's hands. Don't you throw in the towel of righteousness. Don't you walk away from what God has called you to because in due season, you will reap. Let the church say reap. Oh, I want to preach this today. We, we may shout next week. The word reap is this Greek word, therizo, T-H-E-R-I-Z-O, therizo. And the amazing thing about therizo, reap, is that whenever reap is used in the New Testament, reap is always a reference to the final judgment seat of Christ. Reap, therizo, is always meant to remind you that your co-worker doesn't have the last word. Yeah. Reap is a reminder that there's a God who is the judge who sits on the throne of heaven. And when it's all over, said, and done, he alone has the last word over what happens in your life. Somebody, I want you to embrace that word reap as a reminder that God and God alone sits on the throne and God is the judge of our lives. God judges. So here's what Paul says, that word reap, that word reap, it's meant to teach you to do two things. Number one, trust God. Yeah. Reap is a reminder that God sits on the throne. Yeah. Reap is a reminder that God sees what's happening. Yeah. Reap is a reminder that God is weighing out the reward. Yeah. Reap is a reminder that it's not the committee that gives you the reward. Reap is a reminder that God is faithful. Reap is a reminder that God cannot be mocked. That's how Paul starts this thing in verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Now, now let me tell you something. Verse 7 is one of the misused verses in all the Bible. Because whenever we use verse 7, we're, pro we're prophetically uh, predicting damnation on somebody. Here, here's how we use verse 7. Somebody do you wrong. Girl, I ain't got to worry about that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever she did is going to come back on her. We, we quote verse 7, and then we sit back and wait for God to strike someone dead. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, is not a promise of damnation on folk who've done wrong. That's right. That's right. Can I prove it? Because the verse says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, what you sow you shall reap. Here's how I know it's not a promise of damnation. Because you have never reaped all the evil you've sown. Yeah. Yeah. I knew someone was going to pretend that I wasn't preaching to you right there, but there's somebody you ought to just be grateful to God that as you look back at all the evil you did, that God did not allow you to reap everything you sowed. It's not a prophecy of damnation. It's a promise of reward. Here's what verse 7 means. God is not, God sees your righteousness. God knows your sacrifice. God sees your effort. God knows you volunteered. God knows you took the high road when you could have gone low. And God is not mocked. God knows and there will be a reward. At the core of doing right and being committed to righteousness is for you to remember 
who you're being righteous for. If you're only serving for the applause, quit. If you're only singing because you want the solo, quit. If you only volunteer so they'll put your name, quit. But if you know you're doing it for the Lord, Y'all, y'all, here's what Paul says. I love the way you read when you get home in chapter 1. I think it's verse 16. He says, I am confident that God called me to this assignment. That this is what God requested of me. So I'm not doing this for the Judaizers. I'm not doing this for Peter and Barnabas. I'm not doing this for the Galatians. I'm not doing this for the Corinthians. I'm doing this because God called me to this, and this is God's assignment on my life. Judy, I can't preach this to everyone, but the reason I haven't quit, the reason I haven't walked away, the reason I haven't thrown in the towel, the reason I haven't cussed back, sometimes. <laughs> Somebody say progress, 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 progress. I believe in the ministry of progress. The reason I don't is because I remember October 29th, 1989, it was a Sunday. It's 4 p.m. I was sitting in Zion Hill Missionary Baptist Church on the west side of Chicago. I was there to see one of my friends give his first sermon. And right there, God called me. In that pew, I know God said, you're going to preach my word. And whenever church gets on my nerves, I go back to that pew on that Sunday at 4 o'clock and remind myself God called me to this. Whenever I want to quit, I remind myself this is what God said I've got to do. And the only reason you'll stay committed is when you know God called you to it. I'm not doing this for you. I'm not being nice to you for you. I'm not restraining my ugly for you. I'm not showing up to rehearsal for you. I'm doing it because God called me to this. Reap says, trust God. And reap also says, redefine reward. Here's why you can't quit. Because you know your righteousness is for the Lord. And your reward is from the Lord. Can I tell you why so many people quit? Because you're looking to the wrong source for reward. Uh, here's what Paul says. Listen, the reason I'm staying committed, because the Judaizers don't have the last say. The reason I won't quit on doing right is because Peter doesn't sign my eternity check. The reason I don't walk away is because Barnabas' opinion of me is not what's going to determine where I land in eternity. The reason I do this is not because of the growth, not because of the applause, not for the anniversary, not for any name. I do it because I know God will reward. You need to know who holds the reward for your righteousness. Stop looking to people 
to give you what you can only get from God. Okay, okay, okay. okay I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to let you go. I, I, I knew this wouldn't shout at all, but this is... This. You know, I was raised in a different era, and if you were born in the 70s or came up in the 70s and the 80s, you know that it was just a different era. Part, part of it was how we did Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings in my era was cartoons. We sit down, we watch cartoons, and T, you knew cartoons would come to an end when Soul Train came on. You saw that train and Don Cornelius, it, cartoons were over. Um, so, <laughs> Saturday mornings were cartoons, and cartoons were incomplete with a big bowl of cereal. Now, now if, if you have siblings in your age and you're from my era, you know, Saturday was also a fight. The first fight was which cartoon we gonna watch. This is different era. We didn't have flat screens in the kitchen and in bed. We had the one Zenith floor model that... There was no remote control. I was the remote control. Boy, go change that channel. You know, uh, so the first fight was over what cartoon you go watch. But there's a bigger fight about the cereal. Let me explain why. Because back in the day, the cereal box always had, had, a, had a toy inside, a prize. There, there, there was a reward in the cereal box. And because my brother was older than I was, he would often open up the cereal box, reach his hand in, <laughs> and pull out the reward and keep it to himself. And it used to bother the mess out of me that every time I poured out the cereal, there was no reward because my brother had taken it. One day I decided I hadn't had enough. You're going to stop stealing my reward. And so I got up, poured that cereal, no reward. I went to my brother. I know I'm smaller. This ain't going to go right, but I got to try. <laughs> so I jumped on him, and I'm trying to fight him. My dad comes downstairs. My dad says, what are you arguing about? I said, Dad, every time Bruce opens the cereal, he takes the reward. And now I'm fighting him because I want my reward. My dad reached in his pocket. He said, this reward. <laughs> my dad saw what was happening and had reached in and taken it out himself and said, I'm going to hold it. So you stop fighting your brother for the reward. Your brother doesn't have the reward. The reward is in the hand of your father. Somebody, you came to church today ready to quit. You came ready to give up on holiness. You came ready to walk away from righteousness. I came by to tell you that the reward is not in the congregation. It, it's not in the committee. It's, it's not with your coworker. It's not with your supervisor. But it's in the hand of God. God holds your reward. So let us not grow weary in doing well, because in due season, we shall reap. Listen, as you rest yourselves, listen. I can't
kept reciting that, that passage to myself over and over in times of struggle, in times of frustration, in moments when it just didn't seem worth it. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Let us not grow weary. And it finally dawned on me that one of the misappropriated words in that whole verse is us. Because in order to stay committed, you need the right us. But Paul didn't say, let me not grow weary, because he understood, I can't do this myself. But if I've got the right us, if I'm part of the right family, if I'm in the right body, there are people who encourage me, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't let what she said discourage you. Don't let him not calling your name make you quit. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for the Lord. You need the right us. And listen, family, I'm not telling you that we're a perfect church, but I promise you there's some us's in here. There's some us's who want to encourage you, don't you give up. An us who will tell you, don't you stop praying. An us who will remind you that God holds your reward. You need some us. And if you're here today, and you've been struggling in this walk with the Lord, if you feel like it's just not paying off, if you've been ready to quit, Maybe it's because you need the right us. Let us not grow weary. Let us not give up. Let us not quit. So today, if you're here and you desire that us, there's plenty of room at Alpha Street Baptist Church because we're not limited to how many people can get in this building. Our family is defined by those who want to be in relationship. Those who love the Lord and want to be connected to people who love the Lord. So if you're here in this sanctuary, if you're watching online, this is your invitation to become part of us. All you need to do is tap a deacon at the end of worship. They'll be at the altar and in the narthex. Or you can simply go online and fill out that form. We'll reach out to you even today to welcome you to us. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, we will reap if we faint not. generous and faithful and obedient as you continue to sow in the tithe and the offering to help us continue the work of the ministry of the kingdom of Christ. And now to the almighty, the all wise, the sovereign, the faithful, the omnipotent God who alone is creator of heaven and earth. To the God who's made himself perfectly known to us and Jesus who alone and always is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial savior, our resurrected risen reigning returning redeemer to the God who chooses to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all-wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord, who loved the Lord and awaited his return, said amen.
Amen. Go in the grace of God. And may the grace of God go with you.